So hello and welcome to my YouTube channel. So in this video, I wanted to talk about a particular series of psychological experiments that were done by American psychologist Harry Frederick Harlow. Because all I've been doing for the last couple of days is looking into this. One of the reasons why I find these particular series of experiments interesting is because Harry Harlow's experiments actually had an impact in the world of psychology. It changed the way that we think about child development, for instance. Like, for instance, you know, the Stanford prison experiment? Yeah, that was horrific. But did it really say something about the human condition? Not really, because there was demand variables there and... Maybe, maybe I'll talk about that in the next video or whatever. But the point is that the Stanford Prison Experiment doesn't really say that much. There are other variables here. Humans don't suddenly become evil just because they have power. It, it doesn't happen. Anyways, so the point I was trying to make was that, you know, the Stanford Prison Experiment, it doesn't really say that much. Even though it's horrific and terrible, it doesn't say that much. But Harry Harlow's experiments did say a lot. So, okay, let's talk about this. Harry Frederick Harlow was an American psychologist who was born in 1905 in Fairfield, Iowa. Not much is really known about his childhood, but something interesting that I found out about him is that in an unfinished biography, he described his mother as someone who was not particularly warm or affectionate. And this is interesting because of the experiments that he did. Uh, you'll see. In 1924, he attended Stanford University where he was studying English because he had a particular interest in poetry. But unfortunately for him, his grades were not really that good. So instead of continuing to study English, he decided to switch his major to psychology. And he was actually quite talented. He even went on to receive a PhD in psychology. And in 1930, he became a professor at the University of Wisconsin-Madison. At this point, he had some ideas of some experiments that he wanted to do. And for that, he needed some lab space. But unfortunately, the university declined him some lab space on campus. So he decided to conduct his experiments in a vacant factory building down the road. This eventually became the primate research lab where he had his own breeding colony of rhesus macaques, which are basically monkeys on which he conducted experiments on. What Harry wanted to do was to study the role of parental bond on a child's psychological development. During that time, a pretty popular belief among the psychologists was that a child only develops a connection, an emotional connection to the mother because the mother provides the child with nourishment. That was a pretty common belief. And it stems from behaviorism. During that time, behaviorism was on the rise. It was at its peak. It is essentially the belief that all human behavior is caused by the environment. There are no genetic factors involved. It's all environmental. And during that time, behaviorism was on the rise. It was so prevalent that it was considered bad to have contact, physical contact with your child because, you know, you're disturbing the child's environment and that might disturb the natural development of the child. Daycare centers and nurseries were these sterile, contactless environment, which to you and me seem very strange. We can't even imagine a world like that. But at the time, that was the popular belief. So Harry wanted to study this. And he created the child isolation experiment. In order to study this, 
he separated infant monkeys from their mothers and placed them alone in a cage with two artificial mothers. One of these mothers was made out of wood, covered with sponge, and wrapped in a cotton terry cloth. And there was a light bulb behind her, which radiated heat. This mother was soft, warm, and tender. The second mother, however, was not so soft. It was just a bare wire cylinder. You can see it right here. But the major difference here was that this surrogate wired mother provided the child with milk. The soft cloth mother did not. Now, according to behaviorism, the infant monkey should get attached to the wire mother because the wire mother provides the child with nourishment. But that is not what Harry found. The infant monkey instead became attached to the soft cloth mother and only came back to the wire mother when the infant was hungry. Now at the time this was a pretty important discovery and it changed the way that we think about child development. But also uh, this experiment was psychologically traumatizing for the little monkeys because Harry wanted to study whether the infant monkey would get attached to the clot mother or the wire mother. You can't have the monkey get attached to the monkey's real mother. This often meant that the infant monkeys were separated from their mothers at a very young age. And usually these monkeys had no contact with any other monkeys and were just kept in a cage for five to six months. But that's not all because they were also subjected to Harry's other experiments. Now this is one of the uh, more bizarre experiments. Harry wanted to study how a child would respond not to a normal parent, but to an abusive parent. To study this, Harry created another surrogate um, monkey mother, which was exactly like the cloth mother. But this time, this mother provided the child with milk. But not only that, it would also randomly hurt the child, either by pouring ice-cold water on that infant monkey or blowing cold air so hard that these infant monkeys would be thrown across their cage. And he called this mother the Iron Maiden. And what Harry found was that no matter how abusive the parent might be, the child always returned back to the Iron Maiden for comfort, always. Up till now, these experiments are pretty bad, but not really that bad. Unfortunately, it's about to get worse. In 1971, Harry's wife died of cancer and Harry fell into a deep depression. And because of that depression, he was admitted into a clinic and received electroshock therapy for his depression. And as we all now know, electroshock therapy doesn't really work. And this sentiment was echoed by his fellow researchers as well. According to his peers, he wasn't the same anymore. He was a lot more quieter and didn't have the same sense of humor. Now Harry wanted to study the effects of depression and not just of infant separation. So instead of separating the infant monkeys from their mothers, he allowed the infant monkeys to develop a happy relationship with their parents for a few months. After that, he placed them in a device which he called the Pit of Despair. The Pit of Despair was a tall metal tank. It was shaped like an upside-down pyramid with smooth sides 
so that the infant monkey couldn't crawl out of it. These monkeys would then be placed alone in the pit of despair, and although they were provided with food and water, there was no other stimuli. The pit of despair was designed to simulate depression. At first, these monkeys would try to escape by jumping up the sides to get a glimpse of the outside world, only to slip down. And after a few days, they stopped trying altogether. This is a direct quote from Harlow. Most subjects assume a hunched position in the corner at the bottom of the apparatus. One might presume at this point that they find the situation to be hopeless. There was even one report of a monkey spending 15 years in total isolation. The monkeys that spent three months in the pit of despair had severe psychological damage. These monkeys would not interact with other monkeys when released. They would not play with others. But even though they spent so long in the pit of despair, after these monkeys were released, they did show some signs of recovery. But monkeys that spent six months in the pit of despair, the psychological damage was irreversible. The monkeys that spent 12 months in the pit of despair were the worst. They would not eat or even move. Oftentimes, they just starved themselves to death. But unfortunately, this was not the worst experiment that Harry had conducted. Harry wanted to study the effects of depression on the parental instincts of the mother monkeys. He wanted to study the effects of a depressed mother on the child's development. What would their relationship be like? But unfortunately, the monkeys that stayed in the pit of despair and were depressed would simply not mate. To solve this problem, Harry created a device. This was a metal rack to which a female monkey would be tied to in a mating position so that the male monkeys could mate with the female monkey freely. Just why? <laughs> Can I just, like, why? <laughs> why? <sighs> I don't know. This device, by the way, Harry appropriately named the Rape Rack. So, you know, just, just so you know. But that's not all. The result of this experiment, by the way, was absolutely horrifying. These depressed monkeys would often neglect their child. But not just that. If these mothers did not neglect their child, they outright tortured them. In one case, one of the mother monkeys held her child's face to the floor and chewed off the infant's fingers and toes. One of the mother monkeys crushed her infant's skull. Here's a quote by Harry about this. Not even in our most devious dreams could we have designed a surrogate monkey as evil as these real monkey mothers. That part was just crazy for me to think that, you know, these monkeys would just torture their, their child. I don't think I could have predicted that. Once the details of Harry's experiments were released, there was a public outcry. Because, you know, you can't just treat sentient beings like that, you know. These monkeys feel pain and feel love as well. You can't just treat them like that. And thankfully, the university created new code of ethics regarding research animals. Harry died in 1981 because of health problems regarding his Parkinson's disease and... His research lab still operates today, by the way. But fortunately, universities now have an ethics department. So, that's good. <laughs> I guess, I don't know. 
Did universities used to have an ethics department in 1930s? I don't know. I don't think so. That's why all of this happened, you know, because universities did not have an ethics department. That's why all of this happened. Uh, anyways, that's all. That's all that I have for this video. Uh, let me know what you guys think about Harry Hollow's experiments. I think you can excuse some of them because unfortunately for advancements in science to happen, you need to experiment. But clearly, uh, some of Harry's experiments, particularly the ones that he conducted later on in his life, were really bad and were not justifiable in any way, shape or form. So yeah, that's, that's all that I have for this video. This video was actually really interesting to research. If you found this video interesting, you know, maybe give it a like or maybe subscribe. Maybe I'll do more of these types of videos. I don't know. Also follow me on Twitter, even though I don't use Twitter that much anymore. And yeah, that's all that I have for this video. Bye guys. See you guys in the next video.